Be better tomorrow than you are today. I always considered myself a lucky child. I grew up with two amazingly supportive parents. Now, we didn't have much money. I grew up in a council house. But what they did have was time and effort for us. They always made sure that we were out doing activities, whether that was just playing outside on our bikes or whether it was going to things like sea cadets and brownies. My parents always made sure that me and my younger sister, really annoying, three and a half years younger, were out experiencing life. Now, school was never easy for me. I had really bad dyslexia, which back then wasn't really a, a known thing. So I just struggled with English and putting sentences together and essays. So I kind of always felt like I was half failing. I was lucky though, that with a load of effort and support from family and from friends and teachers, that I managed to pass all my GCSEs. This meant that going forwards, I could have a look and see what I really wanted to do as a career. Now I've been involved as sea cadets, so I knew that I loved the outdoors kayaking, climbing, coasteering, all those things around the British coast. So I figured a job that mixed together physical activity and my love for the human body, for medical science, for, for that kind of subject would really, really suit me. So after my A-levels, I decided to go and do physiotherapy. What a great degree, loved it. But I knew that a desk job was never going to be for me. Now, the days that it rained and me and my sister had to stay inside, you know, I was renowned for creating obstacle courses out of all my parents' furniture. They were never very impressed. And, you know, doing round the world and round the room without touching the floor, on the backs of their sofas, the TV stands. So I knew that I had to have something that kept me outside or at least busy physically. Now, I'd been involved in sea cadets, which meant that the military was like in the forefront of my brain. I had a look at all three. The Navy, well, me trapped on a 200 metre boat, probably not good for me or for the other people who may want to throw me overboard. The REF, well, what to say about the REF? I don't really like hotels, not very good at room service. So that was counted out, which left me with the army. The army, someone suggested, you carry tons of weight up massive hills for long distances in horrendous weather conditions. Perfect. Sounds absolutely perfect. So I joined the army. Now, I joined as a combat paramedic. What a job. I got to teach advanced medical skills to frontline soldiers, guys that were going to be able to save their mate's life when their worst day of their life had come around. Now, whether that was that they'd been blown up, involved in a car accident, whatever that was, fallen climbing, they were going to be able to assist their friends, their family, their military family on that day. My career was so fulfilling. The second part of it was that I'd never been abroad before I joined the military. And now I had all these crazy trips to different countries. And I used to downhill mountain bike mostly because I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie and, you know, I, I love a good crash. So one day, a friend of mine phoned me up and said, Neris, Dave, what's wrong? It's like, well, listen, oh, I've got a problem. It's like, OK. And it was unusual for Dave. He was always a really, like, sorted, you know, matter of fact. I said, what's wrong? Well, it turns out his female skier had hurt their ankle, so he had no one to compete for them in the ski championships. He said to me, do you fancy it? Yes, absolutely. Um, Dave, does it matter that I've never skied before? No, 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 he says. It's absolutely fine. You're downhill mountain bike, right? I was like, yeah. He said, ah, it's all downhill. It's all the same. Perfect. Two weeks later, I land in Austria. Wow. Mountains for miles. Snow so white the sun bouncing off actually hurt my eyes. These crazy mountains that like disappeared into the clouds. Bright blue sky. 
It was just stunning, breathtaking. Then you see these black trees and rock kind of jutting out of the white. I was excited. Next day, rock up. The boys are all there. They throw their six foot long skis over their shoulder like it's nothing. Well, whoever invented ski boots is crazy or is a comedian because they've created these plastic bottomed boots that they then expect you to be able to walk on snow and ice. Well, I look like some crazy daddy long legs Bambi crossover. Watch the guys pick their skis up, throw them over their shoulders like it was nothing. Yeah, I tried to do that. I sliced the top of my ear off. I was off to a good start. So we're striding along and we rock up to what looked like a goldfish bowl on a tiny piece of wire disappearing up the mountain. It's like, uh, these people are loopy. They're like 30 men are jumping into this like glass goldfish bowl disappearing for miles uphill. I was like, uh, guys, is this safe? Like, just get in, Neris, just get in. In I got. Now, we've always, I think all of us have experienced that feeling where you're really excited because it's something that you've been wanting to do for your entire life. But it suddenly starts to dawn on you that you may have bitten off just slightly more than you can chew. And it was that horrible sinking feeling as we went up and up and it got steeper and steeper and more and more beautiful. You guys are gonna actually teach me how to do this, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, in the military, we all know what that means. We get to the top of the mountain in this uh, gondola on this tiny wire. The boys all jump out, whack their skis on the floor, jump in their skis and they're gone. I was like, um, okay. I gingerly take my skis off, put them down the floor because they're quite partial to the bottom side of my ear. And I'm trying to get my feet into these skis. Now, plastic bottom boots on ice. Now I've got six foot long waxed bottomed planks. Genius. There is me trying to get my feet in, kicking the skis along, looking pretty special. After a few minutes, this tiny, 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 like tiny child, probably aged about two, rocks up next to me, whacks her skis on the floor, jumps in her skis, and she's gone. I was like, get it together. I just got schooled by a toddler. Eventually, got my feet in my boots. How do you go anywhere? So, I'm there shuffling, shuffling, shuffling. I look down the mountain. There they are. Put my hands up to them. Like, um, how? So they signed back up the mountain to me. Keep shuffling. I was like, just keep shuffling. So I did. Suddenly my skis tip over the edge of the mountain and I'm going faster and faster and faster. I ski past the guys. How do I stop? Poof. Nailed it. Fell over into a pile of powder snow. Yes. Two weeks later, I was skiing. I was ski racing. The feeling. The cold air, the sun on your face, the speed of the downhill mountain skiing, the adrenaline rush. <sighs> Back home in the UK, and I'd been away, so I hadn't seen my parents for a few weeks. So I pop in on them. Now, my parents have both worked their entire lives, and they work full time and really hard. My mum was born completely blind. Here's the joke. She runs security for Cate Prison. Who gave her that job? But you know, saying nothing. My dad did the engineering for one of the NHS trusts. So I've always had parents that have worked so hard. Now I was able to pop in and see what they needed if I could help them out what jobs they needed doing. My parents gave me a list of jobs for the next day. They'd clearly been arguing. You suddenly realise one day 
that you turn into the adult and your parents turn into like the bickering siblings, it'll come to you one day. So, you know, parents back in their corners, no problem. I'll do all those jobs for you tomorrow. The next day I got up, I pulled on fully armoured motorbike boots, fully armoured trousers, motorbike jacket, helmet. Now you may have gathered that I'm a bit of a, uh, you know, speed freak. So I had not one motorbike, but two. So I take out the sensible motorbike, the Kawasaki 500. I'm going along a straight road, doing less than 10 miles an hour. When, bang! Car reverses off a curb and takes me and the motorbike over. My legs get damaged, one of them really badly. My shoulder gets injured and my face hits the side of the car and I get a head injury. But everything's going to be okay. Because everything's always okay. You break stuff. I mean, I've broken stuff all the time with all my mountain bike crashing and ski crashing and, you know, everything always fixes. It's always resolvable. So that was it. Get on with recovery. Let's go forwards. Well, nine months later, it was becoming really apparent that the damage to my leg was really quite serious and that my nerves had been really damaged in my legs. Now, the crush damage in my legs had meant that I had this 24-7 sensation of burning oil being poured over my legs all of the time. And it was creeping further and further up my body. The consultant suggested this fix one day. I was like, yeah, let's do it. I'm there. Today? He was like, no, not today, but, you know, we'll give it a go. And basically the idea was the same with that you've seen in pregnant women when they're about to have their baby, that they have an epidural injection into their spine, which blocks all of the pain. Sounds amazing. Sounds perfect, in fact. The pain's gone. Maybe I'll be able to walk. Maybe, I'll be fi- maybe it'll be fixable. Well, I turned up that day for the surgery and it was supposed to be day surgery and I'd written it off as just this tiny minor thing, just another treatment and I'd been through nine months of this. So I went under. When I came round, something just wasn't right. There were people everywhere. There, there were too many people. There was beeping, there was... Is that my parents? Oh, maybe I'm still under. Maybe I'm not round. No, 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 no. They're talking about pulling the tube out. Yep, no, I'm, I'm definitely awake. Why are there all these people? This is just easy day surgery. Then I realised I don't hurt. My legs don't hurt anymore. They fixed me. It, it's worked. Thank you. Oh, this, I'm f- fixed. Thank you so much. This is brilliant. Neris, you've got to listen, the consultant says. I say, OK. Look, the procedure didn't go as we planned and it's gone wrong. And unfortunately, I don't hurt, though. Yet, yeah, you've got to listen. Unfortunately, I think we've paralysed you from the chest down. But I don't hurt. I was still really excited. I couldn't understand why they were all looking so stressed. It took about four, five months for me to really realise what this was going to mean. It was going to mean that it wasn't fixable. It was going to mean that I was never going to sit up without being lent on something. It was going to mean that I could never go to the toilet without tubes and tablets and faffing and poking and just hassle. Time passed and eventually I went home. But by now, I'm on 10 drugs, some to try and help with the nerve damage, some to try and stop the nerve pain that was now in my chest, some to try and help my mental health. 
but all added together meant that I was now nearing 18 stone. I couldn't sit up for more than a couple of minutes without passing out. I was bed bound. When I wasn't in bed at home, I was in hospital because I had a bladder infection, urine infection, kidney infection, bowel infection, because none of my systems worked properly anymore. I was worthless. I had no job, no sports, nothing to offer my family or my friends, nothing to offer the community, to offer society. Well, I'd always been the carer, the, the person that wants to help, the... Now I'm laying in bed 24-7, wasting everyone's time. I've got carers coming round. I can't even put a sentence together properly to ask them for what I want for dinner. I can't leave the house without passing out and calling ambulances and stress. My family kept coming round and so did some of my friends. But I just couldn't understand why. I hated myself so much and I thought that I was so worthless that my family and friends would be better off if I was dead, if I wasn't there to take up their time, if I wasn't there to force them to come round. So they turn up and I'd turn over, I'd turn my back on them in bed. I wouldn't even like want to speak to them. This guy strides into my bedroom one day, my sister's there says, right, I'm from this charity called Blesma. We're taking you skiing in, in a couple of weeks' time. It's like, what? I can't even, like, what? Is this guy serious? I can't even be in my wheelchair for two minutes, let alone, like, he wants to take me where? America? I just, I can't do it. Can't do it. Little sister, not quite sure when it happened, but clearly did, turns around and says, right, you either get on the plane or I'm leaving at Heathrow Airport for two weeks. I say, like, um, excuse me, who made you the bully out of this, like, you know, sibling pair? I'm the older sister, that's my job. But do you know what? I believed her. I actually thought she'd leave me at Heathrow Airport and I couldn't fathom how I'd cope. Needless to say, I got on the plane. Out in America, these mountains appear. We fly into Denver. There's this green and this white snow and this smell of fresh mountain air. My brain kind of had a bit of a like shiver to it. Then this genius turns up and uh, yeah, so learn to ski, stood up, able-bodied, with the full use of me, on two skis, was hard enough. This guy suggested that paralysed from the chest down, I was going to be able to ski on one ski. I can't even balance or stay upright or not faint in my wheelchair. What? So me and the instructor said, look, You'd be better off spending your time with someone else. Seriously, I'm not worth this. It was like, look, I'm stuck with you all week, so just get yourself together. We're doing this. It's like, okay, fair enough. So basically, they strap you into this crazy tortoise shell and clip you onto one ski. Then put two tiny skis on your arms, so now I've got three things to worry about. I was like, I am never going to do this, ever. And he said to me, well, listen, nurse, if you stay upright for two minutes, that's how long you say you can stay upright without fainting, I'll buy you a beer. I was like, 8.30 in the morning, you'll buy me a beer and I can get out of this contraption. Deal. Deal. Okay. No. I was like a weeble on speed. I fall over one way, he picked me up, I fall over the other, he picked me up, I fall over. It continued for two hours. We maybe moved about 20 metres. So this American goes, all right, we're going to the top of the mountain. I was like, 
okay, we've moved 20 metres in like two hours. Now we're going up there. And how on earth are we getting onto that chairlift? He's like, I got it. Off we go. To the top of the mountain we're going. Seems fair enough. So we get to the top. The weebling continued. Got about halfway down. He grabbed the front of me and was like, just put some effort in. Just try. It's like, hush. But maybe not misplaced. Suddenly, we get to the bottom of the mountain. I haven't fallen over. I think, well, I'm not surprised he got sick of me and bucketed me to the bottom. The guy unclips his skis like he's nuts and comes running over in his plastic bottom boots, skidding to a halt, falling into me, turns his camera around, presses play. And in that moment, he changed my life because he hadn't bucketed me to the bottom. I'd skied myself to the bottom. It may have only been 200 metres, but I skied myself. And if I could do that, what else could I do? Back home, it was hard because back to the carers, the being bed bound, the not being able to sit up, the drugs. But I asked for help getting off some of the drugs to see if that would help. Then there was this 300 mile triathlon advertised from Help for Heroes, Team True Spirit. The guy rang up after I emailed in, said, yep, I'll see you at Tedworth House on Friday. Okay, does he realise that I'm 16 stone? Probably not, eh? Turned up on Friday, this god of a man rocks up. You know, the big triathlon build, huge shoulders, nice legs. And he strolls over and says, follow me. I was like, okay, you're the boss. Don't mind following. He sat me in front of a mirror. And this is what he said. When you get what you want, in your struggle for self, and the world makes you king for a day. Just go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what that man has to say. What do you think of yourself? Well, to be honest, I hate what I've become and this fat waste of space that does nothing, no career, no sports, no hobbies. He says, okay. Register that feeling right here, right now, and let's move forwards. Nine months later, me and five other wounded, injured and sick women complete the 300 mile triathlon. Not only that, but we do it in the world record. We go from London to Paris continuously, 55 hours worth of exercise, worth of swim, bike and running, in our various adaptive means. But more importantly, me and five other people supported each other, inspired each other, pushed each other to achieve something credible. I was lucky enough to get into the Invictus Games 2016. I come away with 10 medals. Me, 10 medals, what? Maybe I need to rethink this worthless thing. Maybe I owe it to the people that have stayed behind me, to the people that have pushed me. Maybe I owe it to myself to be who I am, to be me. I get back, Great Britain are there saying, we've got places to do different sports. Do you want to come and try? I was like, yes. Hang on, I just said yes without any if, buts, maybes. I go on to compete in the Commonwealth Games in 2018 in powerlifting. The most incredible thing, though, has been the situation it's left me in to be able to help others, to show others that no matter how desperate, how awful your mental health, your physical health, how much you've lost, that you can always find something. As long as you say yes, as long as you push yourself to say yes 
to every opportunity that comes up. I'm now involved with the Drive project with Making Generation R. I've acted in a theatre production, Open Air. I've started audio describing to allow visually impaired audiences access to more theatre. All because people believed in me and I said yes. Can you be better tomorrow than you are today? <laughs>